The Red Cross truly has humanitarian value in the community. When you have people in need and you have the ability, you have people in need and you have the ability to help them. Simple things, a cup of coffee, being able to talk to them, help them ease their pain and get their story out. The 07 wildfires was a wake up call. I got to see firsthand what the devastation meant to people and the tragedy that people went through. The destruction was significant and the number of people displaced was truly amazing. We had trouble getting shelters up. We had trouble getting enough people in the right locations at the right time. We were throwing all the resources at it, but Mother Nature is a tough enemy. After the 07 wildfires, we said, what could have been done better? With the new command center using Google Earth, Google Maps systems, all our resources are now in the cloud. I can pull it up on my smartphone or tablet. The majority of disasters is how to get the resources where they need to be, when they need to be there. And without Google Maps, you're doing it blindly. And one of the things that Laura works on is giving us a train map so we can see, given where the fire is burning, where we're going to have to go to create a safe shelter environment to evacuate. Truly having that common operating picture that everybody can access with Google Maps, everybody's seeing the same information at the same time. Our volunteers are using technology they already understand with no additional training, which allows them to do their jobs much better. Bottom line is people. This is all about people protecting property, protecting lives. That's what the Red Cross does. Well, I guess when uh, Gizmo gives a party, we really give a really great party. So uh, thanks for all coming. Uh, we'd like to just do some quick introductions. Um, my name is Alan Leidner. I'm a Gizmo member. Um, I've worked for the city for 35 years. I was the New York City GIS director for a period of time. I directed the emergency mapping and data center following 9-11. Uh, I'm currently the president of the New York State GIS Association, which is affiliated with Gizmo. And I work for Booz Allen Hamilton and through Booz Allen for the Department of Homeland Security in a mapping function. And Wendy? Hi, I'm Wendy Dorf. Um, I, too, worked uh, in government for 35 years. Uh, for 20 of those years, I worked in New York City DEP, and I was tasked with uh, project managing uh, the citywide water main mapping project, <clears throat> which ultimately led to uh, the city map that most of you are using for most operations that you do in the city. And uh, uh, then uh, I, was, I worked at, uh, for 9-11 as the project manager of uh, the deep infrastructure group mapping the infrastructure under the World Trade Center to make sure that uh, none of the first responders uh, fell into the voids. And um, in, in recent years, I've done some infrastructure mapping consulting. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and I'd like to thank uh, Google for making this uh, event possible, Jennifer Montano and Michael Muldo. Um, and just to tell you how it all started is that Dorothy uh, Nash, uh, chair, president, eminence, Greece of, <laughs> of Gizmo, and I were at the New York State uh, summit up in Scandiatilis, and we bumped into Jennifer, and we said, wouldn't you like to come down? I, we didn't know really how extensive your facilities here were. Come down and, you know, give a show and put on something together with, uh, with Gizmo. She said yes, and for about three or four months later, this is what we have. So we want to thank Google for being such a great partner and putting out such a nice spread. Uh, really, GIS in New York City, I would say, is probably we have perhaps the leading or one of the leading programs in GIS in the country and, and maybe probably in the world, and that Gizmo has been an intimate part of helping to build that GIS organization. And also, during 9-11, Gizmo provided really the manpower that staffed the emergency mapping and data center. So Gizmo has really been integral to everything GIS that's occurred in the city over the last 20 plus years. Um, and Wendy, I think, uh, oh, and, and what I would say is, oh, you're going to get a pitch here. If you're not a Gizmo member, you really ought to consider joining Gizmo. It doesn't cost too much. It automatically gives you membership in the New York State GIS Association. And the combination of benefits from both 
uh, are really, I think, overwhelming and compelling. And there'll be information out to you all on, on how to do just that. OK, now that Al has done his pitching, I just have a few words I want to say <clears throat> about our community. I've always been proud to be part of this community. And your presence here is just another indication of your ongoing interest, dedication, and response to events relevant to the well-being of New Yorkers. Never did we dream in the 80s and 90s that the GIS technology being developed and implemented throughout the city agencies to facilitate day-to-day -day operations would be a most critical tool in responding to the attack on the World Trade Center in 2001. That which was accomplished in the mapping center of the EOC during that event became a national model for using GIS in emergency situations. We can all be proud that our dedication then as now has placed geospatial technology in the forefront of emergency response. That being said, let us welcome do Google to the New York GIS community and show them our appreciation as only we can do it. Hi, everyone. Thanks for, <laughs> hello. <laughs> uh, my name's Vanessa Schneider, and you'll have to bear with me. I'm just getting over a cold, so might need a moment during the, during the talk. Um, but to, uh, yeah, so today I'm, I'm representing the Google Crisis Response Team. We have, um, we have members based in, here in New York, and as well as in California, where I'm based, and as well as in Sydney, Australia. Um, and certainly, uh, in the case of Sandy, we had Googlers from across the company helping us, um, and as well as representing, you know, just the crisis community and how much uh, they also really helped us, us in the effort um, before, during, and after, and continue today. So just for some background, um, the crisis response team, it's a project out of Google.org, which is our charitable, charitable arm at Google. And we focus on making critical information more accessible in times of disaster. So with all the things that make Google great, you know, our technology, you know, the scalability that we can do with our products, um, as well as the trust users really have in us, we think that we're, as a team, really extremely well positioned um, to, to make an impact in terms of connecting affected people with the information that they need during these times of crisis. Okay. So let's get started. So here, what you'll see here is just a short breakdown of what I'll be covering over the next 45 minutes or so. I'll be talking about the crisis response team, um, a bit about how we responded to Sandy, and just um, give you some information on the tools and data that we used during our response. Sorry, mic's <laughs> OK, so first let's talk at a high level um, about how the crisis response team responded to Sandy. And some of you guys might be familiar with this as well, both you know as partners working with us um, and just kind of following throughout Sandy. But so okay, so so on October 25th, Hurricane Sandy hit the Bahamas, and its forecast had it headed towards the East Coast. Um, I also want to take a step back and just I, I get a lot of questions around um, you know how does the crisis response team when are they when do they decide that they will respond uh, to something. And we have a lot of criteria for that, but a big one is whether um, we think something is going to affect a major population center. Um, so obviously, in this case of Sandy, all eyes were really on that um, and, and watching its path. So, so the first thing that we did was we launched a new what we call our crisis map. Um, hopefully, you guys, some of you guys are really familiar with the crisis map. Um, but it's basically it included um, preparedness preparedness data um, for, affected use, uh, for affected people on the ground. And in the case of our Sandy map, uh, we had a ton of layers of information on this map, um, including evacuation routes from FEMA. I know there's a big group here, so awesome. Um, and shelters from the American Red Cross, and as well as weather data from NOAA and the National Hurricane Center. Um, but again, if you saw this map, which you can kind of see right here, um, in our main Sandy map. We just had a ton of information. And I, actually, I also have the link um, on the slide there. We still have our maps live today. Um, the information is more focused on volunteer efforts and kind of um, post-Sandy kind of information. But I definitely encourage you, if you've never seen the crisis map, to go to that link and check it out. So um, then we come to October 28th, and mandatory evacuations were ordered in parts of New York City and New Jersey, as, uh, including Atlantic City. And so with this large population at risk, we launched a New York City-specific crisis map. So we actually had two maps going on at the same time. And here's, here you can see the New York City map. 
So this map included New York City specific evacuation zones and shelters that we um, sourced from city and state agencies. And along, uh, we actually had some, some other interesting layers on this, uh, more focused around situational awareness. So we actually had um, webcams that you could tune into. Um, and we also had a curated feed of YouTube videos by our partners at Storyful, which I definitely encourage you to, to check them out and, and read up on them. And we also made those videos available on the YouTube homepage, which users could check out as well. So a lot of interesting stuff. And maybe just if you guys aren't familiar with Crisis Map, just to point out here kind of some of the stuff that you're seeing. Um, yes, map title and map description, but we also um, include links to external sites that, you know, that we think are important that users want to get to quickly. Um, and then just some of the other stuff. So you can actually check on and check off certain layers to kind of change what you're seeing in the map view. And then you, and you can kind of see it. You see a little source. So under each layer, we tell you where we get it. We link to it. And sometimes if we have the data readily available, you can also download, it, download the data directly from the map. So maybe it's a KML that you can download. So we try to, for, in the case of these maps, there is definitely a lot of information going on in the, in the panel. But, uh, but yeah, just take a step back. All right, so again, just to go back over the two maps that I just showed you. So again, we had two maps, and uh, excuse me. So yeah, we had two maps, and again, from we worked with a ton of partners, um, and we got this information from a variety of different places. Um, and, and again, it was a variety of different information, shelter information, gas, inf gas station information, which I'm going to get to in a second. Transit information, obviously, buses and trains were being rerouted. Um, and then we also had, we were also pulling in all of this data in a ton of different formats, um, just a few of them there, geo RSS, and we were using fusion tables. And, but yeah, it, it was basically, we had, we say 400 map edits on the slide. Um, basically, we were working around the clock with a lot of different partners to keep this information up to date and keep it fresh and make sure that we have the most actionable information for users affected on the ground. So another tool that we have on the crisis response team is called Public Alerts. It's a tool that we use to surface emergency information to users um, from sources like, you know, that we have, such as the USGS and from NOAA, and when and where it's useful to the user searching. So Public Alerts are available over a variety of, of platforms. So Google Now, if you're familiar with that on your Android phone, um, Google Maps when you're doing searches, as well as Google Maps for mobile for, for users on the go. Um, and then, as well as Google Web Search. So during Sandy, this is an example. Um, users saw alerts such as tropical storm warnings, as well as high wind and, um, and coastal flood warnings as well. So that's just kind of some of the examples that we use. But we definitely use public alerts across a lot of um, responses that we're doing. <coughs> OK, so moving right along. Um, on the evening of October 29th, so Sandy made landfall bringing with it strong winds and a high storm surge, causing widespread damage. So in the New York, just in the New York area, 2.5 million people were without power. And in the recovery phase, the team focused on the data needs of those affected, of course, which included transfer, transportation information. So again, as I mentioned, you know, buses being rerouted, et cetera. Um, power information, so where were power, out, power outages, as well as food bank information for users who needed to, to get to those. And in addition, um, during the days that follow Sandy, um, the team also partnered with NOAA and the National Geospatial and Intelligence Agency to publish 601 square miles of aerial imagery, So, which I'm going to show you a couple examples of here, um, just of the affected areas. And this is actually a shot of Brick Township, New Jersey, um, that was collected on October 31st. And I actually have, so this is actually the, the before. It's, it's easier to see if you can see the before and after. So again, before, which I think we had taken, that was in 2010. So again, after. Just move. And then this was Mantaloking, New Jersey. So this is the before. Again, we had taken in, this was imagery collected in September 2010. And then again, just in the, in the days after. And one more. Um, that we have a Staten Island, just as this one's striking, all the boats kind of. Okay. 
So I did want to take a moment to talk about Google Maps Engine, which you are definitely going to hear more about today. Um, but I, I just wanted to mention that so we have this tool called Google Maps Engine, if you're not familiar with it. And Noah, the imagery that you just saw, they were able to publish their Sandy imagery pretty broadly just using this tool, which they uploaded to. So via WMS, CAML, and Maps Engine API endpoints, applications like the NOAA Sandy Response Viewer, the Crisis Map, Google Earth, and the Google Earth Gallery were able to feature this imagery and really get it on a lot of, get it to a lot of users. It also withstood a tremendous amount of traffic. You can imagine a lot of folks were looking at this imagery, and uh, yeah, so Maps Engine is great for scaling that kind of stuff. And again, you'll hear more about that very shortly. Okay, so we talked a little bit about the tools that we launched during Sandy. So now let's, I just wanted to, to look at some of the numbers. On October 29th, when Sandy made landfall in the city, our maps saw a huge spike in traffic. 10% were for mobile users, which makes sense. Users aren't necessarily on their desktop at home. And almost 20% of the overall maps traffic was from New York and New Jersey, which is also really interesting. Um, and another really interesting thing is that 82% of the traffic was from non-Google referral sites. So in other words, external sites that were embedding our map and sharing our map around, uh, which was really interesting. So news outlets, for instance, were embedding our map. And we find that a lot of users obviously, you know, they're not thinking to go to google.org slash crisis map. They're thinking, you know, I'll go check WMYC or Huffington Post um, and getting the information. Uh, that way, which is which is really interesting. So we also spend a lot of time kind of working with our news partners to you know make this map available to them. It's easy to embed, and I'll get to that in a second too. So we saw lots of traffic, and we heard a lot of nice things um, from the press. But obviously, the feedback that really matters to us is whether this information is really useful to users on the ground. And these are just some of the. We actually, when we launched the maps, we also included a link. That basically just send us your feedback, let us know how you're using it, which was really eye-opening and really interesting um, just to kind of hear directly from users. And these are just a couple um, different things. Like in the imagery uh, case, it's not just, you know, the phrase disaster porn, but sort of, you know, it's basically users can go on there and they can check out, you know, their mom's house, for instance. We had a lot of users checking up on family just to see kind of the area and making sure that, you know, their loved ones were safe. And again, just like from partners who, who are working with us and, and hopefully um, finding it really easy and useful to, to partner with Google. OK, so, so the crisis map is the team's primary vehicle for visualizing and disseminating crisis-related data. But in developing the crisis map over the last couple years, we've learned quite a lot. Um, and I just, we, we've, I just wanted to highlight some of those kind of high-level learnings for you guys. So I won't go into too much, too much detail with all of these, but here are some of the top lessons, um, which I will give you a second to look through, but let me deep dive more into this. So during a disaster, we often see geographic data spread across the web in viewing frames that are often not suitable or usable by a lay audience and not mobile compatible, which is super crucial, which we will find soon. Um, or it doesn't allow the data to be shown in context. For instance, it's useful for someone affected to see a list of shelters, say, from the Red Cross, and evacuation routes from, from something like FEMA, and then traffic and incidents and warnings, maybe from their local DOT. So again, you want when you're a user and you're going to the map, you want all of that in one area. You don't want to have to go to all these different sources just to see you know, this siloed kind of information. And this is just a few more examples. There's a ton of great geographic data out there and on the web, but allowing it to be shown in that context again and in a way that works for all users across all platforms, that's really what, what we're thinking about when we're developing the crisis map. How can we make that easier for users? So here's, a, here's another um, crisis map, taking a step away from Sandy for a second. Um, this is during Hurricane Isaac, where we were recently, where we were what you see in this view is we, we had a, a NOAA again. They, they flew and collected imagery. And we made this available to users without any kind of special software, um, side by side with other relevant data information, which including like damage reports and that kind of stuff. And actually, what you can see here, which we also had on the Sandy map, you can kind of see uh, we have like an opacity slider. So 
you know, when you flip it all the way to the left, it kind of grays out, and then you can you can pull up the imagery again in a certain area, which is pretty interesting. So I mentioned the formats before. So again, the the crisis map supports a range of formats. Now, I should also mention, if you don't know, uh, the crisis map is an open source tool, which I'm going to get to uh, and get, send you some links so you can read up more on this. But because it's an open source tool, that means you can use it and modify it and, and build your own maps, which is really exciting. More on that in a second. But so again, we, as you can see from this drop down, we take a range of data formats um, and again, make it easy and viewable in one area. So yeah, map tiles, fusion tables, again, GeoRSS, KML, and WMS as well. Or and soon, not right now, very sorely though. So we always get that question. Okay, so for the Sandy team, for Sandy, the team um, also introduced the ability to import data from a CSV, so a Google spreadsheet if you're using those, um, an Excel spreadsheet, as well as XML. So that's great. And uh, here's just one that we that here's just one of the spreadsheets that we used to build one of the layers of warming centers in New York. And here's the view of that same data actually on the map. So again, taking it from a spreadsheet that's not very useful and easy to read and putting it in context and, and making it easy to, to see. Okay. So again, just, just more lessons learned. The mobile first one I had mentioned earlier, obvious. It seems really obvious, but this is definitely a phrase that we use across Google, not just for crisis-related information and, and projects, but also just across all of our tools. Um, certainly in a crisis, as we know, users are not, are not necessarily at their desktop landline computers. Um, so, so making sure that this information is available and easy to use on their phone is, is something that we've continued to work on and iterate on, making sure our maps are, are good there. And here, I just kind of wanted to, to show a couple examples. It's, it's iOS on the left and Android on the right. I think that's probably just a web browser. So again, it's easy to embed and you can see just to flip to the next one. It's easy to share. So you can also, so as a user, I can share this on Google Plus and Twitter and Facebook. I can also just share a link to the map. Um, but I can also, again, like a lot of news sites were doing at this time, they were actually embedding the map. And again, and what's interesting about this is whatever layers you have checked on and whatever viewport you have that you're looking at, that's what's going to embed on your website. And that's what will be shared via that link. So if if you only care about a couple of these layers that you want on, you can certainly customize that. And also, if you are embedding this on your site, you can also, um, there's a couple options for just customizing the look, moving the search box, moving the share buttons. Um, so we make, we, we try to give a little bit of customization, changing the height and width and that kind of stuff. But again, you just would grab that from the share button at the top. Okay. So now we wanted to dive into the creation of one of our crowdsource layers, which is our gas stations layer during Sandy. So this was gas stations of New York and New Jersey. And it's, I think it's a really nice story of kind of, as we say here, the life of a layer, but kind of how do we work from the beginning to the end getting one of these layers on the map. It's quite a few steps. OK, so to begin, not long after Sandy's landfall, we heard from the New Jersey Office of Emergency Management that gas was an issue. And they had gas station information, basically which stations had gas and which didn't. So here's them just kind of reaching out. Oh, Jennifer, that's an email from you, actually, wherever Jennifer went. <laughs> so yeah, here's how um, the OEM was actually making this information available. So here you can see it's a list of gas station addresses in a PDF embedded on their website. You can see that. OK, so where were they getting this information? Well, their authoritative source was the All Hazards Consortium. And so the OEM pointed us to those guys. And then the, so the, the consortium was actually aggregating this information from the gas stations themselves. I think they were using some point of sale information, and that, that's how they were determining um, whether the gas station had, had any gas or not. OK, so how do we get that information in that original PDF onto our map. So there's a guy named um, Atanas Enchev, and he geocoded all the PDF points 
amazing, and made it a layer using Google Fusion Tables, if you're familiar with that tool. So here you can actually see, see that layer on the map. So all of that work led to this spreadsheet. So it took the PDF Excel data, all the address information, and we dropped it into a Google spreadsheet that we could continue to update if we needed to. And then we added it to the map. So, and here's, here's what that originally looked like. So we were like, yes, success, right? Well, then here's what we, so we, here we tried to do all the right things. We took the data from an authoritative source and we made it easily available on our map. But then it turns out that the data wasn't as up to date as we wanted it to be. It was only being updated once a day. So we were actually doing a disservice by not having that most up-to-date information because obviously that stinks, being like driving to a gas station and having, there's no gas there and our map tells you that there is gas there. So, okay, so here we thought about getting help from users on the ground who are actually going to the gas stations and letting them tell us whether this gas station has gas or whether it has, um, you know, like electricity so you can charge your phones. Um, so we took, so, if you can kind of see it in my in my screenshot here, so we took the uh, so we took the data from the OEM, and then we put uh, you can leave a comment on each of the points of the map, and then we were collecting that data from users. And then it was circular though, because when we when we had comments from users on the ground saying no, there's actually no gas here, we could send that back to the OEM, and they could update their data. So it was definitely um, we were definitely reciprocating um, the data, the data sharing. And here's actually some of the crowdsource comments that we got. Um, can't see it from here, but it's basically just simple comments of, again, yay or nay on the gas. So then we had a connection at the White House point us to something called Mapler, if you're familiar with this during Sandy. So it was a gas station map being maintained by a team of students in New Jersey, um, led by Dr. Wan Su M. So it was this team of students, and they were actually, they were great. They were. Um, they were manning these phones, they were calling gas stations, they were just, they were keeping this information um, up to date at an amazing rate. And it's actually what the Department of Energy used to source their trucks that they sent out to get gas, station, to, get gas to new to gas stations, as well as um, generators and things like that. So the Department of Energy was using this as their source. And this eventually became our default gas station layer on, uh, on the crisis map. And then here on the map, you can also note on the, on the bottom right, we have something called recent feedback from the Google crisis map. So again, um, we were taking their data, putting it on our map. We were asking users for their information on the ground, and we were sending it back to them because they were calling people as well, and so they used that. So it, again, it was definitely a team effort, um, a bit scrappy, but it seemed to, it seemed to get, some, get some real use. So. And here's just a, a photo um, from NBCLatino.com of the students who are actually on the phones calling gas stations. I love this photo. These guys are so great. <laughs> so the takeaways here, you know, that authoritative data is really great, um, but in a disaster, it can so quickly become outdated. So for all kinds of reasons, say, like, officials are just unclear what's happening on the ground. So you need to take advantage of that local expertise, just like, the, you know, these students put so much effort into it. And then users on the ground can get that actionable data um, and really be helped. All right. And I did want to um, show you the link to the crisis map. So I mentioned that it, it's um, an open source tool. And so on this site, we actually make the code available that powers our crisis map. And you can use it. Again, you can take the code, modify it. Um, we also have example code that shows you how to import um, all those data types that we also have on there. So I definitely encourage you to, to check out the site and play around with it and send us any maps that you make because we'd love to see them. All right. And here's just some more uh, links. We created a quick little resource site. That's what the Google shortened link at the bottom is, um, as well as just the crisis response website and the crisis map, stratomap.googlecode.com as well. All right. And we'll be taking questions later, so definitely save them for that. Thank you.